guys. Okay. I think that the audio is working. Let me just do an audio test real quick. Okay. I think that the audio... Ugh, I hate hearing my own voice. Hi. Hi. Hi, you all. Welcome, welcome. Um, thank you guys that are in here. Thank you, Fuck Google too. He said, please add your StreamYard link to your description or put into chat so your fans can avoid YouTube. Thank you. That's a really good point. Uh, is it in the description? I edited, I edited my description after you, your comment, but to be fair, I was copy and pasting previous video things, so I'm not, I mean, like, is StreamYard still in? No, not StreamYards. I don't use StreamYards. Stream... Streamlabs? Streamlabs. Yeah. Audio is working fine. Thank you. Speaking of audio, so I figured out a way. I, I sorted out my audio to sound really good and move away. Move away. I don't have words today. To diffuse the noise, I guess diffuse is the word. Um... I had some really good settings on here to diffuse noise and keep things really sounding good so you don't hear my like clicking and clacking with my mouse and all sorts of tapping on the table or anything. But if you remember, it turns out that when I play the piano music in the background, it would try to correct that and it sounded really choppy. So then I found a way to have the piano music in the inside here, um, maybe through Ugh, playing it on YouTube or some shit. But then when we had the Halloween stream, I was having Jay on, and I, again, didn't want the issue of it trying to correct Jay's voice or the movie's voice, uh, movie's audio, when I have this correction going on. So I think I turned it all off. So I hope that it's not too click and clanky right now. If it is, if it's really distracting, because I do click a lot with the art history and reading through pages, just let me know. I'll, I'll figure out how to put those things back on. And speaking of production value, um, I was just noticing how shit this camera is. This camera is shit. This looks like shit. This is way too blown out right here. And even if it's, I don't have this light on, then it's too dark. I need this light. And then it's just, it's just bad quality in general. I think I need, like... What are they called? Uh, webcams? Are those still a thing? Right? Webcams? I think I need like a separate camera because this thing is shit. Um, sounds great. Okay. Well, anyway. I hope you guys are doing well. I haven't been streaming in a hot minute. Maybe I can do piano now if this like thing... I'll, I'll do a test. Let's see how it sounds. Let's do copy... Right, free, back, ground, piano music. No copyright soft piano music for relaxation. No copyright piano. That sounds about right. That's what I'm looking for. Okay, let's see how this sounds. I'll let it play for a second. While I'm talking. And this is the audio test. I'm sorry for it, viewers. I'm sorry, but I like to warm up before we get into our topic for today. So this is the piano. It sounds like it's at a good volume right now. No copyright piano. Could use a professional good. camera as a webcam. I know people do that. Let's see how this sounds. I'll let it play for a second. While I'm talking, and this is the audio test. I'm sorry for it, viewers. I'm sorry, but I like to warm up before we get in. Okay. It doesn't sound like it's interfering. I do hear the clicking and clacking a lot, though, so I apologize. Anyway. I'm a mess today. It's like weird getting back into streaming. I'm not I'm not in my flow. I have a good natural flow when I'm doing it regularly, but I'm not doing it regularly and this is like so awkward. 
piano. Piano music, let's play that. Okay. So content stream, let me get it on. See, this is what I'm dealing with. I gotta bring the thing up into the, into here. Window capture. Okay. If you remember the last time, we were this music is getting really distracting now. Um, you remember last time we went over Turner? I love Turner. He's one of my favorites. I have whole books on him. Uh, what did we go over last? Landscape painting. That's right. Neo neoclassicism. Ah, the Raft of Medusa, Goya, another Goya. Um, oh yeah, and the Romanticism, that's what we did. Yeah, Romanticism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and that leads us right into realism. Oh, God damn it. God damn it. I did a thing. Oh, no. I did a thing where, like, instead of the hand that grips things and moves things around. Oh, there's a. God, I'm so dumb. I don't know how to use technology. Okay, realism. Realism was a movement that developed in France around mid-century against the backdrop of an increasing emphasis on science. Advances in industrial technology during the early 19th century reinforced the Enlightenment's foundation of rationalism. Both intellectuals and the general public increasingly embraced empiric empiricism, the search for knowledge based uh, on observation and direct experience. Yeah, so empirical data is like observed, measured data. Indicative of what the widespread faith in science was, the influence of posi positivism, a Western philosophical model developed by the French philosopher Auguste Comte, Comte? 1798 to 1857. Positivists promoted science as the mind's highest achievement and advocated a purely empirical approach to nature and society. Comte, 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 I'm going to say Comte, believed that scientific laws governed the environment and human activity and could be revealed through careful recordings and analysis of observed data. Like the em empiricists and positivists, realists. Jeez, this song really gets... Okay, realist, artist, I don't know how to work this computer. Why is it frozen? <gasps> Shit, I should remove all my... God damn it, I have so many Adobe's running right now. It's probably not good for this stream. Anyway, um, what were we looking at here? <clears throat> <laughs> like the empiricists and positivists, realists 
artist argued that only the things of one's own time, what people could see for themselves, were real. Accordingly, realists focused their attention on the experiences and sights of everyday contemporary life and disapproved of historical and fictional subjects on the grounds that they were neither real and visible nor of the present. Interesting. So, here and now is what the realists do. Okay, that was intense piano playing. Holy shit. Oop, let me... Two songs playing at once. I hope it's not. Does it sound okay? Oh, maybe you hear it through the piano music background and through the Yeti. I don't know. Let me hear. It really sounds strange. Two songs playing at once. I hope it's not. Does it sound okay? Oh, maybe you hear it through the piano music background. Whatever, sounds fine to me. Unless you guys really hate it. Absolutely hate it. I hate the clicking and clacking I hear on the camera fix that next time. Okay, so to get back into it, but before I do, I forgot that that was Fuck Google 2's main point about addressing the Streamlabs link is that this link right here, streamlabs.com slash TV. Is that the link? Or is it just Martina Marcota? God damn it. Oh my lord, what is my Streamlabs link? Is it slash Martina Marcota TV? Let me see. Streamlabs.com slash Martina Marcota TV. Is that a thing? Okay, yeah, looks like it's working. Slash Martina Marcota TV. And that's a way to send me donations. It's far better than YouTube because YouTube they take like a third of it which is a good amount and it takes like months for them to like send it to you it's just absolute bullshit so if you could and you're interested in sending a donation do it through streamlabs streamlabs.com slash martina tv thank you thank you thank you let's get back to it so we got realists Corbet on realism, I'm going to say Corbet, okay? The Parisian academic jury selecting work for the 1855 Salon, part of the Exposition Universelle in, the, in that year, rejected two of Corbet's paintings on the grounds that his subjects and figures were too coarse and too large. In response, Corbet withdrew all of his works and set up his own exhibition outside the grounds, calling it the Pavilion of Realism. Corbet was the first artist ever to stage a private exhibition of his own work. His pavilion and the statement he issued to explain the paintings shown there amounted to the New Movement's Manifesto. The title of Realist has... Ooh! Aw, oh, fuck Google too. I went, you know, I was just thinking about you today.
Thank you so much, F Fuck Google, too. I really appreciate you. He says, Martina, separating the... Um, <laughs> numinous from the Quotidan since 2015. Okay. I think maybe I've had too many edibles and I don't know what the fuck you're talking about right now. Like, it sounds like you're saying math terms, but I don't recognize any of them. <laughs> Thank you for that so much. It's really, really kind of you. That's 60 bucks, dude. Fuck Google, too. Thank you. I was thinking about you today, too. And it's always, like, the same few people that donate. And it's just, like, I really appreciate it. I really don't... I don't want you to think that it's unappreciated. Or I want you to know how much I do appreciate it. It means a lot to me. I really appreciate it. Love you guys. Okay, the title of realist has been imposed upon me. Titles have never given a just idea of things where it otherwise the work would be superfluous. I have studied the art of the moderns, avoiding any preconceived system and without prejudice. I have no more wanted to imitate the former than to copy the latter. Nor have I thought of achieving the idle aim of art for art's sake. No, I have simply wanted to draw from a thorough knowledge of tradition this, the reasoned and free sense of my own individuality. To be able to translate the customs, ideas, and appearances of my time as I see them in a world to create a living art, this has been my aim. I love that, you know? And it's just like, I wish we could just like portray something in, that's like realist without it being like a caricature of people nowadays. Everything's just a constant caricature pushing some sort of agenda. This is just like realist stuff that, oh no, does the painting look squashed? It looks squashed in your, in your thing. Let me fix this, hold on. That does not look right. It looks better, but it's still squashed. Sorry, I'm just trying to fix it for you. Oh my lord. What am I doing? Fucked it up. Oh well. That's why it's gonna be. An artist must apply. Oh no. Okay. An artist must apply his. Oh wait. Sorry. Let me go back. On Christmas Day, 1861, six years after distributing that statement at his pavilion at his pavilion of realism, Courbet wrote an open letter published a few days later in the Courier. Ah, oh, B BTM lines. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, BMT Lines. It says, always enjoy your streams. Aww. Thank you. I hope we're doing okay, because I feel absolutely so rusty about doing all this. I wonder if it's boring to people sometimes, but I'm learning something new. So yeah, he 
On Christmas Day, six years after distributing that statement at his Pavilion of Realism, Corbet wrote an open letter published a few days later in the Courier du Dimanche, Dimanche? addressed to prospective students. An artist must apply his personal faculties to the ideas and the events of the times in which he lives. Okay, I need to stop and think about that over again. Because this is, again, as an artist today, always trying to... It's just interesting to, to see their advice. Uh, an artist must apply his personal faculties to the ideas and the events and the times in which he lives. Art and painting should consist only of the representation of things that are visible and tangible to the artist. Every age should be represented by its own artist. That is to say, by the artists who have lived in it. I also maintain that painting is an essentially concrete art form and can consist only of the representation of both real and existing things. An abstract object, not visible, non-existent, is not within the domain of painting. True. Accurate. So yeah, the idea of like living in a certain specific time in history and re relaying what that was and yeah it's totally totally an aim of the artist i mean sometimes we saw like byzantine or whatever it was mostly about recreating biblical past things or various things but this guy is talking about um representing their own personal like day-to-day -day. this is this is what life is like kind of art <clears throat> Corbet's most famous statement, however, is his blunt dismissal of academic painting, Ooh. in which he concisely sums up the core principle of realist painting. I have never seen an angel. Show me an angel and I'll paint one. <laughs> That's funny. So this is one of his Gustave Corbet, The Stonebreakers, 1849. It's oil on canvas, five foot three inches by eight foot six inches. And it was formerly at the Gamel de Green. It's a, it was formerly in Dresden, uh, destroyed in 1945. I've never seen that uh, description of of art. Well. This is not Fox Mulder, stop. I was thinking of Fox Mulder and Fuck Google 2 today. And honestly, BMT Lines, because he's also a patron of mine. No way. You guys are incredible. That is too, too kind of you. You guys are always the same few that are just so supportive of me it really means a lot thank you fox Mulder, for the 50 dollars wow I'm doing pretty well with my gold today thanks cool <clears throat> so yeah this artwork was destroyed in dresden in 1945 i think we can all guess what that was about Corbet was the leading figure in the realist movement. In this large work, he used a palette of dirty browns and grays to convey the dreary and dismal nature of menial labor in the mid-19th century France. I'm not really digging these piano musics lately. What is, what is this? This is like... Motivational background music. That's not what I asked for. I asked for piano music. Not motivational piano music, but like... Okay. We'll try this one.
Okay, sorry, I'm jamming out to the piano music. I got lost. Shit. This song is so distracting. <laughs> I keep wanting to jam out to it. Corbet's... Corbet's choice of the working poor as subject matter had special meaning for the mid-19th century French audience. In 1848, workers rebelled against the bourgeois leaders of the newly formed Second Republic and against the rest of the nation, demanding better work conditions and a re redistribution of property. The army quarreled, uh, quelled, sorry, the army quelled the revolution in three days, but not without long-lasting trauma and significant loss of life. That uprising thus raised the issue of labor as a national concern and placed workers on center stage, both literally and symbolically. Corbet's depiction of stonebreakers in 1849 was both timely and populist. Huh. Of, of great performance for the later history of art, realism also involved a reconsideration of the painter's primary goals and departed, and depart, and departed from the established priority of illusionism. Accordingly, realists called attention to paintings as a pictorial construction by the way that they applied pigment or manipulated composition. Corbet's intentionally simple and direct method, uh, methods of expression in composition and technique seemed unbearably crude to many of his more traditional contemporaries who called him a primitive. Who called him a primitive? Although his bold, somber palette was essentially traditional, Courbet often used the palette knife for placing and unifying large daubs of paint, producing a roughly wrought surface. His example inspired later impressionists such as Monet and Renoir, but the public accused him of careless and critics wrote of his brutal brutalities. Sorry, the uh, public accused him of carelessness and critics of his brut brutalities. So that's really interesting. I actually never knew about that. Um, I know that Manet, not Monet, but Manet is the father, grandfather of Impressionism, they say. Um, I think we'll get to him in very soon. But uh, that's really interesting about this Courbet guy um, and how he did these paintings like of these guys out at work really just like roughly and created this texture with a palette knife. I don't know if you guys know what a palette knife looks like. It looks kind of like a butter knife with a weird... No, it looks kind of like a cheese cutting knife maybe? I don't know. It has a little palette thing you can brush on it. It looks like tree bark or whatever you can roughly throw paint on there and I guess that inspired impressionists like Monet and Renoir wow that's interesting and I'm pretty sure the public accused the early impressionists of, of being wasteful so it's interesting that they also accused Corbet of carelessness let me just check in with you guys real quick see what you're Oh shit, okay. Oh, thank you. Wow, I got 30 bucks from GS Evolved. And he says, for the Kubrick-esque uh, Kubrick style freezer section from Twitter yesterday. Thanks so much. I just, sometimes I think those scenes are just so cool. And it's really flattering when people say Kubrick style. For sure, for sure. 
They're just like the buzz of the freezer. I don't know if you guys saw it, but the buzz of the freezer and the the symmetries and the, the lights. It's just, I love it. Thank you for appreciating it. Cool. It means a lot. Thank you for joining us as well. Jean-Francois Millet, like Corbet, Jean-Francois Millet, 1814 to 1878, found his subjects in the people and occupations of the everyday world. Millet was one of a group of French painters of country life who, to be close to their rural subjects, settled near the village of Barbizon? Barbizon. This Barbizon school specialized in detailed pictures of forest and countryside. In the the gleaners, not cleaners, the gleaners. <coughs> Let me see. Oh, I actually, while I, God damn it, while I'm reading things, I actually have the paintings up for you. God damn it. Let me do this. Hold up. Sorry. There we go. Except it still doesn't look right. That's generally what it's supposed to look like. There we go. Eh. Whatever. That's what it's going to look like right now. Twelve fifteen. That's twelve fifteen. God, this music is so goddamn distracting. I don't know how I'm gonna be able to read over this. It's getting really epic. Okay, twelve fifteen. The Gleaners. Malay depicted three peasant women performing the backbreaking task of gleaning the last wheat scraps. These impoverished women were members of the lowest level of peasant society. Landowning nobles traditionally permitted them to glean, to pick up the remainders left in the field after the harvest. Malay characteristically placed his monumental figures in the foreground against a broad sky. Although the field stretches back to a rim of haystacks, cottages, trees, and distant workers, and a flat horizon, the gleaners quietly going about their tedious and time-consuming work dominate the canvas. Let me look at it again. 
again with what you guys are seeing. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Cool. I see much more in this now. It is lovely. Uh, you got the gleaners here picking, picking things up. And then you have the foreground, the background, excuse me, with this horizon line and the sky and all the people back here doing shit. Cool. Guy on a horse. They dominate the foreground. This is way too distracting. This fucking music sucks. Andy's song, minimalistic piano and orchestra. Okay. I'm not sure if I'm digging these piano music in general. Sorry, I'm just doing a sh it was a shitty playlist. I didn't like I don't like it. I miss my old piano music. Piano music no copyright. Okay, let's try that. Oh god, it's another playlist. It's only five minutes long? I can't deal with that. It needs to be like ongoing. Okay, so what did we just read? Yeah, 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 yeah. But dominates the canvas. Although Malay's work ha works have a sentiment sentimentality absent from those of Courbet's, the French public still reacted to his paintings with disdain and suspicion. <gasps> In the aftermath of the 1848 revolution for Malay to invest the poor with solemn grandeur did not meet with the approval of the prosperous classes. Further, the middle class linked the poor with the dangerous, newly defined working class, which was finding outspoken champions in social theorists such as Karl Marx. Karl Marx, 1818 to 1883, and Friedrich Engels, 1820 to 1895, and the novelist Emile Zola, 1840 to 1902, and Charles Dickens, 1812 to 1870. Socialism was a growing movement, and its views on property and its call for social justice, even economic equality, frightened the bourgeois bourgeoisie. In Malay's sympathetic portrayal of the poor, many saw a political manifesto. Whew. Yeah. Yeah. SJW. Old school SJWs right there. <clears throat> Interesting. So let's go back to my thing now. Here we have a section on lithography in this era and, and the genre. And it says lithography, Greek for stone writing, was the invention of the German printmaker Alios Senefelder, 1771 to 1834, who in 1798 created the first prints using stone 
instead of metal plates or wooden blocks. In contrast to earlier painting techniques, see woodcuts, engravings, and etchings, chapter 8, in which the artist applied ink either to a raised or incised surface. In lithography, the printing and non-printing areas of the plate are on the same plane. Huh. The chemical phenomenon fundamental to lithography is the repellence of oil and water. The lithographer uses a greasy oil-based crayon to draw directly on a stone plate and then wipes water into the stone, which clings only to the areas the drawing does not cover. <clears throat> Next, the artist rolls oil-based ink onto the stone, which adheres... Wait, hold on. Next, the artist rolls oil-based ink onto the stone, which adheres to the drawing but is repelled by water. Okay, when the artist presses the stone against paper, only the inked areas and drawing transfer to the paper. Interesting. Color lith lithography requires lithography, lithography? Uh, requires multiple plates, one for each color, and the printmaker must take special care to make sure each Im impression lines uh, lines up perfectly with the previous one so that each color prints in the proper place. This is... Uh, let me bring up this picture for you guys. So this is... Honore? On Honore? Dumier? Rue... Transnonian 1834. It's a lithograph. It's one foot by one foot, five and a half inches. And it's at the Philadelphia Museum of Art in Philadelphia, bequest of Fiske and Marie Kimball. Daumier used the recent invention of lith lithography, lithography, lithography lithography to reach a wide audience for his social criticism and political protest. This print rec records the horrific 1834 massacre in a workers house workers housing block in Paris. Damn, you know what? Talk shit about the French all you want, but they don't like fuck around, man. I swear to god, they don't fuck around. Checking out on you guys. All right, we'll go back to the book. Oh, yeah, so. Let's keep looking at that picture, actually. We're still on that. So, Honoré Daumier. Because people widely recognize the power of art to serve political means. See, this is, I find it fascinating and really, really interesting to see in our history how things always relate to today's world. Because you can't forget that we are living in history, in historic moments right now, today, and how that can apply to the arts today, right now, and in every single section we've pretty much gone over it. <clears throat> Whether it's Byzantine, or Caesar, or um, what are the other ones over there around that time? Greek and Roman shit. Uh, they've always used things to bar Baroque, to influence society and use art to influence society. So let's see what they have here. Because people widely recognize the power of art to serve political means, the political and social agitation accompanying the violent revolutions in France and the rest of Europe in the later 18th and early 19th centuries prompted the French people to suspect artists uh, of subversive intention. I mean... Not wrong, not wrong. Art, 
always has a subversive intention, but it's interesting because people were funding certain arts and now like they were, <laughs> now that people are like, hmm, a little suspicious of you artists. You guys are subverting everybody. Okay, so an Honore, I don't know if I'm saying his name right, Honore Damier was a defender of the urban working classes and through his realist art, he boldly confronted authority with social criticism and political protest. In response, the authorities imprisoned Damier. A painter, sculptor, and one of the world's greatest printmakers, Damier produced lithographs that allowed him to create an unprecedented number of prints, thereby reaching a broader audience. Damier also contributed to satirical lithographs to the widely read liberal French Republican journal Caricature. In these prints, he mercil merciless mercilessly lampooned the foibles and misbehaviors of politicians, lawyers, doctors, and the rich bourgeois in general. Bourgeoisie in general. Dumier's lithograph Rue Transonian, this picture that you're looking at here, depicts an arist... Uh, sorry. <laughs> Sometimes I, like, I have dyslexia. I, my husband insists that I'm dyslexic, and I say that I have no issues whatsoever with anything. Um... I'm really old school about that. I'm like, how dare you say that? No, I don't have anything, but it, I do read things kind of really weirdly backwards, so I'm sorry about that. Um, Domiro's lithograph, Lou Transnonen, depicts an atrocity with the same shocking impact as Goya's 3rd of May, 1808, which is what we saw last time. If you remember the Goya's 3rd of May, 1808, there was some sort of thing going on, I think. I think it was with uh, the people and uh, and like the military or something or was it the other another country's military or something yeah anyway the lithographs the lithographs title refers to a street in Paris where an unknown sniper killed a civilian guard part of a government force trying to repress a worker demonstration because the fatal shot had come from a worker's housing block, the remaining guards immediately stormed the building and massacred all of its inhabitants. With Goya's power, Domier's, Domier created a view of the slaughter from a sharp, realistic angle of vision. He depicted not the dramatic moment of execution, but the terrible, quiet aftermath. The broken, scattered forms lie amid violent disorder. Domier's pictorial manner is rough and spontaneous. How it carries expressive exaggeration is part of its remarkable force. Yeah, that's sad. I'm just checking on you guys real quick. Hello, Templar Rising. Yeah, I know. I haven't been around a lot, but... Oh, shit. I forgot to mention right away in the beginning. Next week, next Friday, I will have uh, Lloyd Kaufman on to do a little chit-chat interview with him. So, if you guys aren't familiar with Lloyd Kaufman, he is an awesome filmmaker, director. He's an older guy who is, like... The owner of, uh, the creator of, uh, Troma, uh, the Toxic Avenger, all that stuff from back in the day. He's a really, really cool, fun guy. He's got a lot going on. He's always doing stuff. He's always really supportive of my work and Lady Alchemy stuff. So come join us and again, hang out with Lloyd Kaufman, living legend right now. Our guy. All right, I've got these absolutely disgusting hemp cigarettes. They 
are not the same as tobacco. I'll tell you that. You never get... You never get, uh... Anything that tastes like tobacco. So I might just do a commercial real quick. That's right, JM cigarettes. Um, Tox Avenger was cool. I might just do a break real quick. Hold on. Wait, how are you guys doing? Let's just take a break for a minute. Ask about surf Nazis must die. Okay, I don't exactly, I'm not sure about that one, but I have been checking out some of his other stuff that he's been doing, and um, he's got some where, like, there's definitely making fun of SJWs, there's, uh, the Shakespeare shitstorm. I don't know if that's like a recent, recent one. But that looks really funny. Can't wait to talk to him about that. Sorry. I'm just jamming to the music now, smoking this, actually, it actually hits the spot when you don't have anything to smoke. Oh, happy birthday, Nick Monroe. It's Nick Monroe's birthday. You guys can always, uh, you guys can always give him a follow. Shoot your, uh, shoot your stuff in the chat. He always has some really great updates and angles on the news and things going on, so good follow. Alright, well, I guess I'll just go back into reading it. We were just going over lithographs. Um... Sorry, trying to figure out window capture, that's what I'm doing. There we go. Why does it look like this? I don't understand why it's looking like this. Is it stretching out this way? It's so annoying. It's actually more square, rectangle than, than anything, so it should really be like that. I just don't know why it's not showing you everything. Oh well. So, we'll just go back to this. I hate technology. I wish I had a producer to show out. This is so annoying. Oh, no, that's not what I want to. Mm. No. That was really annoying. Anyway, I'm just going to read. Edward Menet. 
Like Gustave Courbet, Edward Manet, 1832 to 1883 was a pivotal artist during the 19th century. Not only was his work critical for the articulation of realist principles, but his art also played an important role in the development of Impressionism in the 1870s. Manet's masterpiece, don't know how to say it in French, but I'm going to call it The Luncheon on the Grass. Launching on the grass. Depicts two women, one nude. Wait, there's two women? Oh, yeah, there is two women. <laughs> I always remember the one, the naked chick. Depicts two women, one nude, and two clothed men enjoying a picnic of sorts. Consistent with realist principles, Manet based all of the foreground figures on living people. The seated woman is Manet's favorite model at the time, and the gentlemen are his brother with Cain and the sculptor Ferdinand Lenoff. Lenoff? Lenoff. The two men wear fashionable Parisian attire of the 1860s. In contrast, the nude woman is an idealized unidealized figure type. She also seems disturbingly unabashed and at ease, gazing directly at the viewer without shame or flirtatiousness. So, Fatty is just sitting there, chill, unabashed for being naked. Just chilling. This audacious painting outraged the public. Rather than depicting a traditional pastoral scene, uh, this painting represented ordinary men and promiscuous women in a Parisian park. Parisian? Parisian park. Manet surely anticipated criticism of his painting, but shocking the public was not his primary aim. His goal was more complex and involved a... a reassessment of the entire range of art. This painting contains sophisticated references and allusions to many painting genres. History, painting, portraiture, pastoral scenes, nudes, and even religious scenes. In fact, it is in fact a synthesis and critique of the history of painting. The negative response to this luncheon on the grass piece by the public and critics alike extended beyond Manet's subject matter to his manner of painting. He rendered in soft focus and broadly painted the landscape, including the pool in which the second woman bathes. His loose manner of painting contrasts with the clear forms of the harshly lit foreground trio and the pile of discarded female attire and picnic food at the lower left. The lighting creates strong contrast between darks and highlighted areas. In the main figures, uh, many values are summed up in one or two lights or darks. The effect is both to flatten the forms and to give them a hard, snapping presence. Form, rather than being a matter of line, is only a function of painting and light. Manet himself declared that the chief actor in the painting is the light. Manet used art to call attention to art. In other words, he was moving away from illusions and toward, and toward open acknowledgement of painting's properties, such as the flatness of the painting surface, which would become a core principle of many later 19th and 20th century painters. Yeah, so they always say Manet is, I think, the father of Impressionism. Um... Yeah, I think that's what I said earlier. Manet's the father, grandfather of Impressionism. Not Monet, Manet. That's right, Lars. He said, fact, nudism is trad and conservative. Um, hello, Dan. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Oh, hey, Larry. Nice to see you again as well. I have missed everybody dearly. Okay, so where are we right now? Okay, so time for another Mane piece. Oh, oh, I think my thing is missing. It's 
missing one of them. Hold up. We need mayonnaise Olympia, people. We need mayonnaise Olympia. She is not in this set right now. There we go. Now she is. Oh, before we switch, let's let's just zoom in a little bit. There's the lady in the waiting pond. No one ever notices that lady, even though she's like right in the middle. Because everybody's looking at this broad. So let's look at the flat, the flattened colors and lighting. I mean, I think it still looks quite good, but that's why they call him the father or grandfather of Impressionism or some shit. Because he's, he's just starting to kind of play with the idea of like very flattened outlined figures like these figures are more outlined than one normally did when they were painting that's i guess his brother the cane all right now we have olympia <laughs> you guys are funny. Okay, so even more scandal scandalous to the French viewing was uh, viewing public was Manny's Olympia. Ah, I think this one is what kicked off the Salon de Refuse. No, no. Uh, let's see. This work depicts a young white prostitute. Olympia was at the time a common professional name for prostitutes. Interesting. At the time, this was a common prostitute name. Olympia. Professional name. Anyway, she's reclining on a bed, entirely nude except for a thin black ribbon tied around her neck, a bracelet on her arm, an orchid in her hair, and fashionable slippers on her feet. Olympia meets the viewer's eyes with a look of cool indifference. Behind her appearance, a black maid who presents her a bouquet of flowers from a client. Client. Olympia horrified public and critics alike. Although images of prostitutes were not unheard of during this period, the shamelessness of Olympia and her look at and her look at that verges on defiance shocked viewers. The depiction of a black woman was also not new to paintings, but the public perceived Manet's inclusion of both a black maid and a nude prostitute as evoking degeneracy. A moral depravity, degeneracy, inferior, inferiority, and animalistic sexuality. The contrast of the black servant with the fair-skinned courtesan also made a reference to racial divisions. One critic described Olympia as a courtesan with dirty hands and wrinkled feet. Her body has the livid tint of a cadaver displayed in the morgue. Her outlines are drawn in charcoal, and her greenish bloodshot eyes appear to be provoking the public, protected all the while by a hideous negress. That's a quote. That's a quote. That's not my quote. Sounds like a, a Biden, Joe Biden quote, but that's not either. Where is this quote from? Um, anyway. From this statement, it is clear that the critic was responding to Manet's artistic style as well as his subject matter. Manet's brushstrokes are rougher and the shifts in tonality more abrupt than those found in traditional academic painting. This departure from accepted practice exacerbated the audacity of the subject matter. <laughs> I 
<laughs> Jay says, whoa, that escalated quickly. <laughs> she does have some rough looking feet. Client is simp. He sent her flowers. Oh, God. She's been through a lot. You guys are funny. All right, let's have a close-up on this courtesan, this prostitute, and the... So, you know, it's interesting because I... You know those people when they have the artists... Uh, they have art where they'll swap white and black figures or something... And they did this one, which I always found odd because I knew that this was a prostitute. So I was like, so you just made the black woman a prostitute? I mean, that makes it kind of worse, no? Now you're talking black exploited women. Sexually exploited women. I don't know. You don't always want to switch spots, trust me. <laughs> okay. Let's move on to Homer and the United States. So, although French artists took the lead in promoting realism and the notion that artists should depict the realities of modern life, this movement was not ex exclusively French. The realist foundation in empiricism and positivism appealed to artists in many European countries and in the United States. Winslow Homer, one of the leading American realist painters, uh, one of the leading American realist painters was Winslow Homer, 1836 to 1910, of Boston. During the Civil War, Homer joined the Union campaign as an artist reporter for Harper's Weekly. At the end of the war, he painted Veteran in a New Field, this piece that we are looking at here. Although it is fairly simple and direct, this painting provides significant commentary on the effects and aftermath of America's catastrophic national conflict. The painting depicts a man with his back to the viewer harvesting wheat. <coughs> Excuse me. Homer identified him as a veteran by the uniform and canteen carelessly thrown on the ground. The veteran's involvement in meaningful and productive work implies a smooth transition from war to peace. This was seen as evidence of America's strength. The peaceful and harmonious disbanding of the armies in the summer of 1865, poet Walt Whitman, uh, 1819 to 1892, wrote was one of the immortal proofs of democracy, unequaled in all the history of the past. Veteran in a New Field also comments symbolically about death by the 1860s, farmers used cradle um, seeds, sits, seeds to harvest wheat. Cradled seeds. In this instance, however, Homer rejected realism in favor of symbolism. He painted a single-bladed seeth, seeth, thereby transforming the veteran into a symbol of death, the grim reaper himself, and the painting into an elegy to the thousands of soldiers who died in the Civil War and into a lament lamentation on the death of recently assassinated President Abraham Lincoln. Okay. So this is Winslow Homer, a veteran in a new field, 1865, oil on canvas. It's two feet, one and eight inches by three feet, two and one eighth inch. It's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Um, I've probably seen that one in person. This veteran's productive work implies a smooth transition to peace after the American Civil War, but Homer placed a single bladed seat in his hands, a symbol of deaths of soldiers, of the deaths of soldiers and of Abraham Lincoln. 
Okay, cool. Well, I forgot to also go over this one again real quick. I am just going to read this out to you. This is Manet's Olympia, 1863, oil on canvas. It is four feet three inches by six feet two and one fourth inch. I didn't realize it was that big. And it's at the Musée, Museum d'Orsay in Paris. Manet scantilized the public with this painting of a nude prostitute and her black maid carrying a bouquet from a client. Critics also faulted him for using rough brush strokes and abruptly, shift, abruptly shifting tonality. Okay, let's see what's next. Oh, this is like a really famous one too. Right, right, right. Oh my god. That's me. Right here at the bottom left. I do not like seeing that at all. Okay. So Thomas can Aikens, even more resolutely a realist than Homer, was Philadelphia-born Thomas Aikens. I don't know how to say that name. Let me look it up real quick. E. A. Kins. E. A. Kins. How to pronounce? Aikens. The pronunciation of this word sounds like Aikens. Aikens. Eakins. Eakins. Okay, I'm gonna go with that. Ah, my clip on earrings are hurting me now. Mm. That hurts. Okay, so Thomas Aikens, 1844 to 1916. The too brutal realism of Aikens' early masterpiece, The Gross Clinic, prompted the art jury to reject to reject it for the Philadelphia ex exhibition that celebrated the American Independence Centennial in 1876. The work presents the surgeon Dr. Samuel Gross in the operati operating amphitheater of the Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia. Gross, with bloody fingers and scalpel, lectures about his surgeries on a young man's leg. Watching the surgeon are several colleagues, all of whom historians have identified, and the patient's mother who covers her face. The painting is an unsparing description of an unfolding event with a good deal more reality than many viewers could endure. It is a picture, one critic said, that even strong men find difficult to look at if they can look at it at all. Hmm. It's probably really weird for him to see that too back then. Okay, now we have some sculpture piece. Mm -hmm. 
So we have... Edmonia Lewis. Realism also appealed to some American sculptors. Edmonia Lewis. Kind of like that name. Edmonia. Is that a girl or a boy? Circa 1845 to after 1909, produced a work that was stylistically indebted to neoclassicism, but depicted contemporary realist themes. Forever Free, <coughs> this marble figure, uh, is a marble sculpture Lewis carved while living in Rome, surrounded by examples of both classical and Renaissance art. It represents two freed African-American slaves. The man stands heroically in a contrapposto stance reminiscent of classical statues. His right hand rests on the shoulders of the kneeling woman, and his left hand holds aloft a broken manacle and chain as literal and symbolic references to his former servitude. Produced four years after Lincoln's um, issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation, Forever Free was widely perceived as an abolitionist statement. However, because Lewis was female, uh, African American, and Native American, she was the daughter of a Chippewa mother and African American father. Scholars have debated the degree to which the sculptor attempted to inject a statement about African American gender relationships into the statue. For example, does the kneeling position of the woman represent Lewis's acceptance of female subordination? Lewis's accomplishments as a sculptor speak to the increasing access to training that was available to women in the 19th century. I mean, we're not taught about that. We're just taught we're oppressed all the time. Educated at Oberlin College, the first American college to grant degrees to women, Lewis financed her trip to Rome with the sale of medallions and marble busts. Her success in a field dominated by white male artists is a testament to both her skill and her determination. So you got some black female artists back in the motherfucking Renaissance time being successful. We, you have people complaining that they can't get they can't even get anything nowadays because they're black or a woman or some shit. Interesting. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, and, and it's good. If you look at the sculpture, there's no doubt about this. I mean, this has the, um, you know, poses, the contrapposto. This has, it looks like a Greek and Roman thing this looks it looks fantastic but it's depicting this woman and a slave being free or whatever and you know what i mean doing art of the times and doing it well i i love it and it's really fantastic that you know she was successful it's just really interesting how they try to portray that you can't do anything um if you have certain skin color when clearly even back then, it was successful. You could be successful. Anyway, let me just see where we're at here. Okay, now we are going through England. Let me just switch camera angles here. Hold on. Okay, so. Here we have England. Realism did not appeal to all artists, however. In England, a group of painters called the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood refused to be limited to the contemporary scenes strict realists portrayed. These artists chose instead to represent fictional and historical subjects with a significant degree of convincing illusion. The Pre-Raphaelites wished to create fresh and sincere art, free from what they considered the tired artificial manner propagated in the uh, academies by the successor of Raphael. Influenced by the critic, artist, and writer John Ruskin, 1819-1900, the Brotherhood, organized in 1848, agreed with his distaste for the materialism and ugliness of the contemporary industrializing world. Okay. 
Let's hear this again. The Brotherhood, organized in 1848, agreed with the distaste for the materialism and ugliness of the contemporary industrializing world. So it's really interesting because that's the kind of stuff that we talk about today with the left being into like ugly ugliness and stuff, you know, the Roger Scruton type of, of mentality. Um, but people often confuse modern with contemporary. Um, they mean contemporary. The contemporary art means artwork today. Modern art was like late 1800s to like 1950s, 1970s. So when people are talking about modern, I think they mean contemporary. Although it doesn't not apply to modern because that's when the ugly art kind of started to happen, but they mean today. I just need some pistachios, huh? Mmm, pistachios are so good. Mmm, I love pistachio. Okay, so we have... The pre-Raphaelites also appreciated the spirituality and idealism, as well as the art and artisanship of past times, especially the Middle Ages and early Renaissance. So then we get into Ophelia. One of the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood's founders was John Everett Milius, 1829 to 1896. Milius's painstaking observation of nature is apparent in Ophelia, this figure right here, which he exhibited in the 1855 Universal Exposition in Paris, where Courbet set up his Pavilion of Realism. The subject from Shakespeare's Hamlet is the drowning of Ophelia. Ophelia. Every time I see Ophelia, I think Ophelia balls. I don't know why. To make the pathos of the scene visible, Milius became a faithful and feeling witness of its every detail, reconstructing it with a lyricism worthy of the original poetry. Although the scene is fictitious, Milius worked diligently to present it with unswerving fidelity to visual fact. He painted the background as a spot along the Hogsmill River in Surrey. For the figure of Ophelia, Milius had... you so much about Google too for another ten dollars he said in the period you're reading 1850s to 1890s it was the era of French courtesans and drawing room Paris art gangs of New York City the Civil War and the Wild West Buffalo Bill GG by Colette took place in 1890 for example cool yeah I mean, I was just thinking about it too, about that time period, and it's like, got some Victorian in there. And just like, thinking back, it was actually quite an exciting time. It seems like it was just this really super old fashioned thing. But in the art world, it was, 
it was very exciting and they were about to get into like photography's coming up and then they started getting weird with this impressionism and and uh, the Dadaism is coming up, all that stuff. So it's it's starting to get really, really interesting. Yeah, the Civil War. He painted the background as a spot along the Hogs Mill River in Surrey. For the figure of Ophelia, Milius had a friend lie in a heated bathtub full of water for hours at a stretch. Hmm. Okay, so... That's that. John Everett Milius, Ophelia, 1852, oil on canvas, 2 feet 6 inches by 3 feet 8 inches, and it's at the Tate Gallery in London. Millet was a founder of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, whose members refused to be limited to the contemporary scenes strict realists portrayed. The drowning of Ophelia is a Shakespearean subject. And then we have this guy, which I forgot to read, is Edmonia Lewis, Forever Free, 1867. It is marble, three feet, five and one-fourths inches high. James A. Porter Gallery of Afro-American Art, Howard University, Washington, D.C. Edmonia Lewis's Forever Free, carved in Rome four years after Abraham Lincoln's Eman Emancipation Proclamation, owes a stylistic debt to neoclassicism but depicts a realist subject to freed slaves. And I just, I love the use of like all the Western references and everything. There was, it seems, appreciation and uh, instead of what we have today of trying to tear stuff down and, and replace. And um, this is more of a like cultural appreciation thing than trying to like replace. And then we have <coughs> this guy again, Thomas Aikens, The Gross Clinic, 1875, oil on canvas, 8 feet by 6 feet 6 inches, and it's at the Philadelphia Museum of Art in Philadelphia. The too brutal realism of Aikens' depiction of the Jefferson Medical College operating amphitheater caused rejection of his painting from the Philadelphia exhibition celebrating American Centennial. I mean, I think it's 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 good. It's quite depict it's a depiction of, you know, what was going on with the medical world. Um, but then we end with this, which is just stunning. I love this picture a lot. And, yeah, I kind of wanted to stop there, but we're only an hour and 40 minutes in. Usually I do two hours, but let me just show you what I have going on here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then we have the next section, which is architecture, and it is quite short, I think, and then there is photography. It's just, and then that's the end of it, so it's kind of, I don't know what to do because maybe I'll just save architecture and photography for next time. We'll break up what we're doing a little bit more because sometimes I get into it and then it's like I want to commit and it's like three hours long. I think an hour and 40-ish minutes. Hour, you know, close to two hours is pretty good and then whatever it takes to wrap up architecture and photography. So I like to end it clean. 
and not dip into the next section, which is really exciting. Look at this stuff. We got Whistler going on. Okay. Oh, this is totally wrong angle for you guys. So let's see, what are you guys up to? Most of the world is really poor. Jay says the 1800s, 1900s was far from idealistic. I agree, it's never idealistic really. But it was an interesting time. It just seems really boring and Victorian. But there was things going on. So, yeah. I don't know. I'm here for another few minutes. If you guys want to chit-chat with me, we can super chat, Streamlabs, donation, whatever you call it. Dan is, is going for that it was a good time in that time. Yeah, I mean, there's always shit going on, but it was more interesting than it seems when you think about it. There were things happening. And there are always things happening, so it's just interesting to see history happen. And in the art world, you don't really realize really what's going on and who the major players are it's just like they're watching and creating and, and history will show how was the weather lol chit chat <laughs> weather was shit in new york it was one of our shitty rainy windy days so yeah so like i said guys next week next week Friday. It's going to be a little earlier, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's when I could get Lloyd Kaufman to come on. So he will be joining us. I hope you guys are around 6 p.m. next Friday. Lloyd Kaufman of Trauma, Toxic Avenger, all that stuff. That's right, Troma Pablo. You better come next Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're gonna have Lloyd Kaufman of Troma. It's gonna be a fun time. So I'm gonna try to make some cool graphics and things and videos. potential to burst into a far better society if the Great War didn't pull us away, of course. <sighs> and that's right, fuck Google, too. He can tell people how to market a movie on $200 bucks and some burgers. That's what I'm talking about, and that was one of my pitches to him about, you know, what we talk about is like, I mean, with cell phones nowadays and the camera qualities and just how things are, there's ways of making movies that he didn't have access to that back in the day but you can make movies with pretty much anything so it's interesting and it's interesting with what people call the kubrick grocery store shot that i got of uh i don't know how to use these old simple movie making techniques to to tell a story it's really interesting might want to explore that a little bit more tell stories guys Oh, thank you, Larry, for the five bucks. He says, thanks again, Martina. Nice to be back for your lectures. Oh, lectures. I like that. 
We're doing some lectures over here. I mean, they are. It's art history class for adults. We get to just be ourselves and make ridiculous comments. Ridiculous commentary to art history class. That's what this is. I'm gonna eat some peanut brittle. I really appreciate that, Larry. Thank you. All right. I'm out of here then. See you guys next week. Don't miss it with Lloyd Kaufman. 6 p.m. next week. Mm -mm. Bye.